Okay. Dr. Trichu is a clinical neuropsychologist and the Associate Director for Education and Evaluation with the VA Puget Sound Healthcare Systems Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center, or GREC. She's also an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She has specialized in neurodegenerative disease and geriatrics throughout her career, and her clinical work and research has been focused on the full continuum of cognitive aging from dementia to super aging into the 90s and beyond. Since joining the VA, uh, Dr. Trichu has developed an additional and complementary interest in the care of older veterans with PTSD and cognitive concerns. And she comes to us um, with much experience and um, a long-term presenter and a favored presenter um, with this series. So welcome, Dr. Trichu. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, careful, you don't want to set the bar too high or anything. No, <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to continue to, to join in this series um, on a topic that's really near and dear to my heart and my career. Uh, thank you all in the audience for joining this afternoon, or perhaps it's evening if you're a little further east uh, of Puget Sound. I hope you all have some energy left today, um, and I also hope you like my vintage PowerPoint background. I'm going to be speaking today um, about frontline tools uh, that are useful when you're trying to differentiate, um, identify, and maybe even move forward in treatment planning for older adults who may have delirium, dementia, and depression. I don't have anything to disclose. I've got no financial advantages to this. Um, I am somewhat opinionated. So the University of Washington and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs would like me to make clear that the views and opinions of this presentation are mine um, and should not be taken as some sort of official policy. So Dr. Cochran did this great introduction to the four M's, and I'm guessing at this point you all have seen these before, but let's just think a little bit about how this Dementia Winter Series uh, fits in with that greater context of aging and healthcare. Um, we have these four pillars to consider, right? When creating and practicing in an age-friendly healthcare setting. I think it might already be a little bit obvious that we're gonna be focusing on the mentation aspect today. Um, but always keep in mind that this is occurring within a holistic um, situation, both for the, the patient themselves, but also within the healthcare framework and these other pillars of the four M's. Uh, and I also really emphasize um, that medications can have a lot of effect on thinking. So thinking about polypharmacy, whether a veteran is taking their medications properly, either not taking can cause cognitive issues or perhaps doubling up can call cognitive, cause cognitive issues. Um, that's all part of mentation as well. Mobility doesn't at first seem as connected perhaps, um, but, but if someone has some cognitive challenges and you're say trying to work with them to develop new routines, whether it's a sort of occupational therapy in a home setting, or, or maybe they actually have to learn to use a walker or a wheelchair, the cognitive challenges that they have will have an additional impact on that quality of life that their mobility can provide. Uh, and then of course, uh, as Dr. Cochran said, what matters is really at the top for a reason. At the end of the day, as healthcare providers, we can want all sorts of things for our patients and we can um, really try hard not to input, you know, push our values um, or, or our goals onto the patients we work with, um, but we still need to ask them what, what matters to them and kind of always be referring back and, and keeping this patient-centric viewpoint. So sorry, that's just my little plug for the importance of the four M's there. In the talk today, I've got certain learning objectives that I think we're going to hit on with no problem. Um, basically, I, I hope that you come away from this talk feeling like you can characterize both um, all three, dementia, delirium, and depression a little bit better than you could before, although I'm sure you all have some sense of some of them. Uh, and then within that, though, being able to really think about what are some of those key similarities and differences that help us distinguish between the clinical syndromes, maybe even recognizing when you've got more than one thing going on. 
then of course, it's great to recognize warning signs, um, but you also want to feel confident about how to initiate a diagnostic workup, whether you, you're doing all those steps, whether you're directing them to the next appropriate care provider to, to engage in those steps. Maybe it's a team approach, which I might, you might hear more than once from me as a, the best way to go at it. And then of course, whatever data we gather when we're initiating the diagnostic workup, we want to think about how that could guide treatment, how that can guide care planning, of course, with the veterans uh, input. Uh, I, I feel like I always have to do the obligatory couple slides like, hey, why is this important? Um, and, and so just thinking last year in 2022, the oldest baby, boomer, baby boomers actually all turned age 76. They are not young, older adults anymore. By 2030, all of the baby boomers are going to be at least 65. So this, this population uh, in the United States, and I am focusing on the United States today, um, is really going to grow a great deal. Um, and it's expected to be 88 million by 2050. Of course, these numbers shift a bit. I haven't seen any good reliable numbers for the COVID pandemic and what kind of impact that might have. Uh, older adults uh, are important in healthcare because they do constitute a larger proportion of many aspects of care. Uh, they are 26% of all physician office visits, a third of hospital stays, a third of all prescriptions, almost 40% of um, EMR, med emergency medical responses, and a little less surprisingly, but important to consider the cost of this, 90% of nursing home residents. Uh, this picture is just to give a sense of how high the percentages are in certain clusters across the United States um, and and the, with a lot of counties actually having 25% or more of their population being over age 65. Now, this sort of has some limitations to what we can draw from this. You can see some of these counties are very huge. Some of them are small. Um, and the resources are not... Um, distributed in, in a manner that actually matches this. And so as care providers, even if you don't end up going into geriatrics, I mean, I hope if you're involved in this series that you, you may have a little love for geriatrics, um, but then at the very end of the day, you're going to come away being someone who is feels more equipped and more excited about caring for older folks uh, in healthcare. A thing to think about also is that, um, and I talked a little bit about sort of the, the increased hospital stays, office visits, prescriptions, these things do cost money. And unfortunately, in our country, there are over 15 million older adults. That's actually almost one in three who are over 65 who are economically insecure. Um, it's more often older women who live in poverty. Um, it's also uh, the proportion is higher in Black and Hispanic adults who are over age 65. Um, and while social, social security benefits do help lift up above the poverty line, a lot of older adults, it doesn't exactly put them in the position where they have excess money. They are still, um, uh, while not economically considered insecure below the poverty line, they still have very tight finances. And I guess this is just a blank slide. Hold on a second here. Oh, right. So I just wanted to think about where, how are things possibly going to be changing here? And this is pulled from some Census Bureau data. The figure on the right is figure one, and it's showing just trends. Um, the It's a little hard. It's a little blurry. On the right side is um, female is how they've defined it, population. Um, and on the left is male. The age scale is right there in the middle, and it starts at the bottom at zero, and it goes up to 100 plus. And then on going from the middle outward is zero millions out to three plus millions. And you can see just kind of interestingly with the green being the 2010 census numbers, you can see that bulge right around 55 back then um, that represents the baby boomers. And then you can see how projections up to 2030, which is the, the sort of, um, purple color, and then up to 2050, which is the lavender, how this is going to shift over time. You can also see that there's going to be a larger number of women aging older over time as well. Um, so just sort of thinking a little bit about how uh, that can affect uh, the resources we have and what we need to do to care for these folks. Perhaps a uh, figure two here is even more important in that it is highlighting 
that dependency ratios um, and showing how they are split between youths who are dependent, which is pretty typical, right? Most eight-year-olds can't take care of themselves um, versus old age dependency. And while dependency in under 18 and youths is expected to stay very consistent on through 2050, we see that there is increase in older age dependency. And our goal as healthcare providers, or at least I feel like it is, and it's what I hear from the people I work with, my patients are veterans, their goal is better quality of life, being independent and aging in place. So all of these things are their main goals that I hear over and over again. And it's kind of what my goal is to help them with. Oh, I threw in just some numbers um, for folks that are in this Northwest region, and because and, that's really where the, the bulk of our attendees are coming from. And it was just showing, I pulled this just to throw out there to show that the, there were projections for what the population would be over age six or, or over age 65 in these states. And um, every state except for Wyoming and Washington actually, oh, I'm sorry, the numbers are all higher well, from the census of 2020 than what was projected um, for that. So this is showing that at least pre-pandemic, um, the numbers were turning out to be even higher than what were expected. Okay, so how to care for this increasing and changing demographic. Uh, you know, I really would love to have far more geriatric specialists out there, but that's just not going to hit. That's not going to hit everybody, um, especially in rural areas. So it ends up falling on the shoulders of primary care providers a lot. But a primary care provider often only gets 15 minutes for a follow-up appointment, and that's just not going to cut it either. Uh, so really, uh, what we call at the VA a packed team, it's a, a patient-aligned care team, is, is the distributed burden to kind of care for these um, folks who have a lot of complexities um, and need more comprehensive care. Uh, so I just want to say that if you think about how much mentation impacts what matters to folks, their quality of life, their independence, their ability to age in place, and of course, whatever you learn from your individuals that you work with, um, you could imagine how swiftly untreated delirium, depression, and dementia, if, if not unrecognized and not managed and supported, um, will have dramatic consequences for our aging, uh, for the aging patient. So recognizing these right away is important. That healthcare team approach is best. Let's talk mentation. That's what you're here for. So here are things that I hear in clinic, and I'm imagining you might hear them all too. And you can hear them in all sorts of settings. You might overhear it in a waiting room, the elevator, at the at the cafeteria, um, or right in when you uh, have someone in front of you in the exam room. Things like, I can't focus. Maybe a loved one says she's not interested in her usual activities, uh, not being able to come up with the word they want, low energy. I definitely hear my husband's selective attention is worse. He doesn't listen to me at all anymore. Um, Short-term memory is shot, uh, losing a car in the parking lot. Or maybe way more concerning is you didn't tell me to increase my atetalol and stop taking HCTZ when you know that you did and it's documented in the chart. Uh, so do you know what these are? Can you immediately decide which one is depression, which one is delirium, which one is dementia? The truth is they're all red flags, right? But it's not gonna be specific to any of the 3Ds in particular. So before I talk a little bit more about the three Ds uh, and especially the cognitive symptoms you might observe, let's let's remind ourselves what's typical cognitive aging. And I I use my little quotes here um, because typical there is no perfect typical and there definitely is no normal aging. Um, it's very subjective. Heterogeneity in health and thinking increases with increasing age. So it's tricky. It makes it harder, right? You have to try to think if you can get any information or if you, maybe you've been working with someone long enough that, or you have chart notes that go back far enough that you can get a sense of their baseline. Or if you don't, then maybe you're lucky enough to have a collateral, a family member who can give you a sense of their baseline. Of course, that's often clouded by our, our various uh, impressions of those around us, but usually there's some great information to be gleaned. So I'm going to try to use the word typical, but frankly, I fall into the trap of saying normal aging myself. 
So things that do not typically change with age, one's own autobiographical memory, knowing where you were born, how many siblings you have, if you have any, um, maybe even remembering the name of your first grade teacher. These are things that people hold on to. Uh, and other recall of well-learned information, things that you um learned in school, uh, facts, those things tend to be pretty well ingrained. You know, Paris is the capital of France. You may never have been there, but you just kind of know that. Procedural memory. This is a good thing and a bad thing, right? The ability to get behind the wheel of a car and drive it is pretty much procedural memory, unless you're really, you're changing it up with some of the, the new electric vehicles or something. And so folks can do it because this remains intact well into any kind of serious uh, uh, cognitive problem. Um, even though they may not have the ability to do all the other aspects, say, of driving uh, and to be safe and responsible. But those procedural memories, how to brush your teeth, you know, how to wash dishes, do laundry, these all stay really strong. Emotional processing stays strong throughout aging um, when it's typical aging and not affected by some other process. Uh, there's all sorts of horrible ages stereotypes out there. Um, you hear phrases like the grumpy old man or that sweet old lady. These are horribly ageist um, sort of stereotypes. Um, and the idea that someone's personality will change dramatically as they get older is just not the reality. Um, if someone's personality is changing notably, this is probably due to something else going on that possibly could represent a medical emergency. Uh, what does typically change is that um, there's a little bit decreased encoding of brand new information, um, might need a little bit uh, more repetition, maybe just a touch slower learning new things, right? You got a lot of processing that's got to go on there. Um, multitasking, really juggling like 50 things at once, that, that decreases consistently with age, although it's often balanced out with a little more wisdom about what's really important and thus what should be done first. So sometimes that can balance it out. And then also just like reaction time seem to slow down with age. Um, and that seems pretty inevitable processing speed, um, slows down a little bit, a, a bit as well. But in case you thought that that processing speed just starts up when you're older, I would like to point out here, the speed of processing category. That's these sort of greenish colors. They start, the performance starts actually declining in one's twenties. It's just that it's subtle, right? The, this may look like a really steep curve, but none of this is actually going down steeply in typical cognitive aging. Uh, what does sometimes happen though, is you can see here that sort of knowledge, these are more sort of wisdom types of things. They kind of are actually slightly going up right up into one's fifties and sixties. And so sometimes what I think you see or hear from the patients we work with is a lot of self-awareness when they hit kind of this crossover point, or maybe they don't even notice the crossover point, but they retire. Sorry, I'm using my cursor here and realizing I'm using it on the wrong screen. Um, so this is coming down steeply, but it's not really steeply because these are small increments of change overall. And here we have this slow increase of this world knowledge. Here's the sort of uh, inflection point. Um, people may notice some subtle changes here. They may even notice it a little further out here when they have life circumstances that change like retirement or a medical disability, and they become more aware of it. So this kind of ends up when you think about who comes in with cognitive concerns, this is sort of where the, the, the worried well, although I don't really love that expression, um, where they may actually show up in your office. Okay, but we wouldn't be here if all changes were typical, right? So while everyone experiences some slight cognitive changes during aging, there are many folks who may experience challenges that are greater than that. Um, and, and that's what brings people in. That's what we're looking out for. Uh, typically, people don't say, oh, I'm really worried I'm going to develop delirium in later years, or I'm going to really worried I'm going to develop depression. They're worried about developing dementia. Uh, so that's often the words you're hearing from folks, but you need to think more holistically, what else could be going on, right? Regardless though, you're going to try to pick up on these, these red flags. Um, 
And there's considered to be multiple stages uh, here before you get to what can be clinically diagnosed as clear-cut dementia. The important one is called mild cognitive impairment. That's what the MCI stands for. And this is where there are changes that are of concern, uh, maybe to the person, or maybe not, but definitely to those around them. They've noticed changes. There's one or more areas of thinking that have become impaired or having a notable change that it cannot be what baseline was. However, these folks are still able to live completely independently. They've got enough cognitive abilities and reserve that they can do what they need to do. It's that tilting point here that I'll talk about in a second that, that defines dementia. So what is dementia? Well, it's gotta be a decline in some aspect of thinking or behavior, um, usually in more than one. And then here are the check boxes. Dementia is significant. It has those functional consequences that I was talking about. People lose the ability to do some aspect of their daily independent living on their own. Now, can you help set up a lot of things for them? Transportation, maybe you set, uh, you start doing their big finances. Um, but if suddenly you were gone for a month and they had to do it on their own, there would be errors, maybe significant problems. Dementia is chronic. Dementia does not get better, right? This is based on actual neurodegenerative changes in the brain, typically has an insidious onset. Even if there's one event that stands out for people is when they notice there was a problem it's, it's crept up on them and it does get worse over time. Now, that doesn't mean that people can't sort of have a good day once in a while, but what you would not see is someone performing uh, uh, and having a certain level of cognition one year, the next year scoring and doing much better and then going back down again, and then we wouldn't be due to it a progressive neurodegenerative disease. Also keep in mind, it's gotta be an, a loss. Um, these are new impairments. It's not lifelong. If someone has a learning disability, even if it didn't get diagnosed in childhood, um, and they still have troubles with learning now, that's, that makes it harder to decide what's a change or not. Um, and it may be an area of vulnerability for them, but you want to try to figure that out. Similarly, I work with veterans. Um, a number have had head injuries or strokes. They've had then some recovery from those traumatic events and that's their new baseline. So then I'm trying to detect if there's additional change beyond that new baseline. And always dementia is based on some sort of structural damage to the brain. There are neurons that have died, whether it's due to a pathology in the brain, like Alzheimer's disease, or maybe to um, vascular change due to those little sort of, we'll call them micro strokes. That's not the technical term. Um, what dementia is not? Well, it's not delirium. It's not depression. We have to be careful that we don't, um, See, you know, don't let someone get diagnosed with dementia because of sensory deficits, right? Maybe there's a lot of vision loss and hearing loss, um, or maybe they've had a stroke and they have aphasia. It's tricky, but you have to work around that to figure out if it meets criteria for dementia and rule these other things out. And it's definitely not normal aging. So what are the most typical types of dementia, uh, causes of dementia in older adults? Uh, Alzheimer's disease, number one right? It's the most common. Uh, next is a vascular uh, dementia, which is caused by cerebrovascular disease. So those vascular changes in the brain, they can be big changes such as like caused by a full stroke, a cerebrovascular accident, or maybe it's um, more subtle changes that develop over time due to microvascular ischemic changes. The person may not know that those are happening and only imaging and their performance would reveal that. Another fairly common type of dementia or cause of dementia is Lewy body disease. They're also um, for folks that have Parkinson's disease who are older and have had their Parkinson's disease long enough. It's very common to develop dementia there as well. Uh, and less common is frontotemporal dementia, what's called FTD, but I do highlight it because that is a situation where folks typically have a lot of behavioral and personality changes first. So they, that can sometimes get confused with um, certain psychiatric diagnoses, including depression. So we always have to watch out um, that we are not missing 
things that can mimic a dementia. Uh, and, and so I've just sort of lumped a few here. Uh, it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but it's things that, that I typically run into most often. Um, maybe there's polypharmacy, too many medications, uh, perhaps a B12 deficiency. Hypothyroidism actually can cause a bit of depression, a little bit of cognitive clouding. Um, and of course, organs that are important for say, clearing the blood, removing toxins, um, can cause some impairments in thinking and any kind of actual, um, toxins or poisons can do that as well. There's all sorts of systemic illnesses, um, that can cause something that might look like dementia, um, insufficient oxygen or blood flow can, can cause some changes in thinking. And then this bottom list here, uh, depression and for me with veterans, particularly a PTSD flare in late, uh, post-traumatic, I should say PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder, a flare or a sort of an emergence of PTSD in later years can, can mimic some of those early signs of an early dementia. Sleep apnea, probably in the general population, is is one to really watch out for. Uh, you know, obviously, if it's treated well with a CPAP, that's less likely to be a cause of thinking changes. But a lot of people don't even know that they have sleep apnea, um, and of course, it is treatable. So let's say you identify these. That's great. Attack it. But do keep in mind that sometimes the treatment may improve, but not fully reverse symptoms. In which case, you want to continue to monitor people. So delirium, uh, back when I was in training, it had all sorts of names, just depending, were you in the neurology department or were you in psychiatry? Were you on the, um, the, the, the MICU, the medical intensive care unit, um, they sometimes called it toxic metabolic encephalopathy, acute confusional state. But luckily I think, um, delirium is a much more broadly used term across specialty areas. This really is considered to be a medical condition, not that the others have no medical basis. Um, but the, the, the key thing here is that there's typically a much more rapid onset. The deficits in thinking are primarily noted in attention and concentration. All those deficits there can affect a lot of other areas of thinking as well, but, but acutely um, there's impaired attention and concentration. And interestingly, this is where you might see someone seem really clear one hour and then two hours later, they are confused. They don't know where they are. There may be, even if they're in the hospital, trying to pull out lines because they're, they're scared. Um, and so we typically look at uh, infections, medication problems, other uh, metabolic abnormal or abnormalities as the, as the most common causes. And what is challenging is that in older adults, the mental status changes can precede any objective signs of illness. So say um, a urinalysis to detect a urinary tract infection might look fairly normal when they first show up at the ER, if one's done, um, but hopefully they're hospitalized for their safety if it's needed. And the follow-up shows that there is a urinary tract infection and um, treatment is initiated. Uh, also, and this is what I cannot help but stress enough is delirium is under-recognized. It's under-recognized in all sorts of settings, even in inpatient units, it's under-recognized, but it's especially under-recognized by caregivers, family members, uh, primary care teams, um, and even sometimes in emergency rooms. If you are interested in doing a deeper dive reading of delirium, the first author of this Lancet article here, um, Sharon Inouye, is just really the leader of research in this area for clinically meaningful research in this area um, and her Boston-based delirium research group. She's, she's the guru. What's delirium not? Well, it's certainly not insignificant. There is significantly increased mortality when folks are followed over six to 24 months. This has been shown in many different settings across many different research groups. Um, it's not dementia. Uh, and it's not rapidly resolving. I, I stress this because remember how I mentioned those metals, mental status changes can show up before the objective signs of illness. Well, guess what? An infection can be cleared before the mentation clears. And this, if you work in say a discharge setting from the hospital, you really have to think about where are you sending them home to? If they're going home to where they are alone and there's no one going to catch if they make mistakes or double up their medications or don't eat for two days, um, you probably will see them right back in the hospital. For those of you that'll pro that may end up more on like primary care teams and in those settings, just be ready. When someone comes to you for that follow-up visit out of the hospital, 
please, please, please be on the lookout for any signs that they might still have an unresolved delirium or that they're starting to develop another one. Um, and delirium is not normal aging. So I think I've, I, if I haven't beat this horse, I'll, I'll probably beat it a little bit more. Um, hospitalization is a high risk factor for delirium. It affects in older adults up to 40%. There are a lot of studies that have tried to figure out, well, what beyond hospitalization are those risk factors um, for this, this to happen? And you can see here, one study found that dementia is one of the biggest risk factors for developing delirium in the hospital. The general illness severity of what brought them in, having a visual impairment, being catheterized, um, and a few other uh, factors as well. Um, longer hospital stays are problematic. Uh, another study that I thought was quite strong with a really large sample um, is this hip fracture hospital sample. And they found just coming in for a hip fracture, 35% of these folks ended up uh, or had a delirium at some point. And here were the factors that they found um, were associated with that higher risk, greater age, um, dementia, actually having had a delirium before, um, and then a couple of these other things. So um, I think I've mentioned most of these uh, red flags for delirium. Maybe what I haven't commented on though is the fluctuating sleep disturbances there in the middle. Uh, that can be a, a first sign. And then moving into what could either be a hyperactive or hypoactive state can be indicative of delirium. And folks may even shift between these. So the thing I always worry about is the hypoactive person with delirium. Uh, the agitated person may get hurt or hurt themselves, but they often end up in the ER. Uh, the hypoactive person is the one who it may not be recognized in. And one of my saddest stories was a, a caregiver that um, we, there had been a diagnosis of early dementia. Um, and then I saw them back again after a hospitalization and she, the, the wife felt horribly guilty because he had been in a phase of dementia where he was pestering her with questions, the same question over and over. And then over the course of a week, he kind of just stopped asking her questions and just sat in his chair and was quiet. Um, and then one day she went to rouse him after what she thought was a nap and he was unresponsive. And then of course called the ambulance, you know, the, the EMR and an ambulance came and realized that he had a delirium. Um, and he was fine. Um, but her guilt was pretty high. So as a care, um, as healthcare providers, we can try to help people know what signs to look for, um, to call in or to bring them in. Uh, hallucinations and some paranoia can show up with delirium. Um, and as I mentioned, sort of that increased somnolence. So switching to depression, our third D, uh, this is sometimes a little easier to distinguish, but not always, uh, overall. Yes. Can I, can I just, um, there's a few questions about delirium in the chat. Oh, good. Not and chance. because I've got my thing screen set up this way, yeah, I can't see the fine. chat. I'm, I'm tracking it. Um, um, Lisa's asking, aren't anesthetics a high risk factor for delirium and so that, narcotics? Well, narcotics definitely um, can be a risk, um, can increase risk for delirium. Anis, um, so I, th I think you mean like anesthesia for a surgery. That is a tricky one. I would say that I clinically feel like I have seen that and heard that so much. It feels true. I definitely have dug into the research and um, it goes back and forth. I think what always complicates it is that the surgery is being done to help something that, you know, typically for a thing that might have already been likely to cause a delirium otherwise. So uh, yeah, I, I would have to do a new deep dive into the literature there. I, I do think though that the confusion when someone's coming out of surgery, you know, recovering can be that, that recovery can be a little slower, that cognitive clearing. And so, um, again, discharging people too soon to go home and mess up their medications or whatever would definitely be a risk factor. Yeah. And then others brought up were UTIs and PNA and electrolyte imbalances. I, I, is that a que the question? Because definitely UTIs are, are uh -huh. a huge top of the list. And those other markers um, on, on, on panels would also be indicative uh, yeah. that there could be uh, that there could be a medical problem causing a delirium. Yeah. Okay. 
that's it. Thanks. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. And I don't mind an interruption folks. So, so definitely if it feels like it's sort of in the moment, um, please just put it in and, and hopefully <laughs> Dr. Cocker will cut me off again. I do like to talk. Um, so thinking about depression uh, and I'll come back around to all three of these, by the way. So thinking about depression, um, I've just got a list here. I won't read over it all. Okay. I won't, I won't do that to you. Um, but, but do keep in mind that there are often symptoms of depression that, um, are sort of physiological, um, whether it's GI upset, increased sense of pain. Um, and, and so do keep an eye out for that. I'll come back around to it. The challenge I think is that depression is not just a bad day, a bad week or a month. You know, that's pretty normal. It's not just grief. It's normal to, to mourn losses, um, whether it's a, a loss of independence or getting a new medical diagnosis. Um, the challenge though, is that it's not untreatable in older adults and never should it be thought of as a cause of dementia. I don't hear pseudo dementia as much as I used to, um, but these are not the same um, health problem and, and therefore should be recognized and, and approached um, independently. So I think I've, so here, I mentioned this, these non-specific physical symptoms, right? Very, very tired, low energy, um, perceptions of pain that seem beyond what there's actual causes for. And I don't mean that you should be just believing them that they don't feel the pain. They feel the pain. Pain is real. It's all about perception with pain. Right. Um, but keep in mind that if you've got someone in your office that that's kind of doing this, that you should also be assessing for mood as well. And not just like say throwing on somebody mentioned a narcotic, right. Throwing on a pain medication, you may be treating the wrong problem. Uh, and it's changing, um, but older patients still might be less likely than younger patients to use words like depressed. Um, and so trying to think about your language and changing it up a little bit, you know, have you been blue? Has your mood been low? Are you, you know, give folks the opportunity to, to, to describe how they've been feeling in the words that are relevant for them. Um, and cause at the end of the day, I wish we didn't live in this society, but depression and mental health issues are still stigmatized. Uh, and so there can be a real reluctance to, to talking about that, especially in like a five minute interaction. Um, but the people will read you if you're, if you're empathic, if you're open, if you seem like you're not just doing a checklist, um, the chances that they will share with you are increased greatly. Uh, I often ask about uh, mental health symptoms, not just uh, in my interview, but also with like a little questionnaire. So, and I do that later on to give them like another opportunity if there's, if there's something going on. So depression in older adults um, is actually quite prevalent. As many as 10%, 10% of those over 65 seen in primary care settings have been found to have clinically significant depression, not just a little depression, but clinically significant depression. And here's the scary thing. It's also been shown that only about 10% of those with depression are then um, getting treatment after that's recognized. Uh, what really probably is one of the best places to start is with behavioral activation, uh, meta analyses uh, of a number of randomized control trials, which are kind of considered the gold standard can show that just moderate and moderate intensity exercise can bring down depressive symptoms. Um, and I think what's forgotten is that, um, younger and older adults can respond equally well to treatments for depression. This can be psychotherapy and, or pharmacotherapy. Uh, what is important when you're working with older adults though, is to think about all their medical comorbidities for the best treatment options. Pharmacotherapy is not always the best way to go, especially right out of the gate. Um, and then psychotherapy can have caveats as well. If someone has a, say moderate stage Alzheimer's type dementia, they may may not have enough of the um, memory, new memory and creation abilities to say, do a cognitive behavioral type therapy. Um, so just kind of really tuning it to the folks that you're working with. Emily, I have, can you yeah. um, just contrast the, what you were describing as the um, percentage of depression in older with um, that in younger age groups? Ooh, that's a good a question. And I don't know, cause I don't work with anyone <laughs> under 50. Um, I, I, I actually just don't know. 
Um, I don't think it's um, higher or lower. I think it's probably pretty similar. Um, there may be some um, specific populations within certain ages that are may have higher depression rates. Um, but I think if you just looked at a chunk of 30 somethings, 40 somethings, 50 somethings, I, I think this is probably a base rate prevalence. Um, but thank you for asking that question. I may, maybe, maybe I'll go pay attention to younger adults again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, and I'm going to skip over this. I'm not a prescriber, um, but I wanted you to have it in your notes, mostly because I think um, if someone is a prescriber and is going to use an antidepressant to treat uh, later life depression, you want to be really mindful of what options are most appropriate in older adults to try, because there are a number that are contraindicated um, due to anticholinergic effects or other um, uh, negative side effects. So, uh, I do want to say though, that you do want to continue to monitor those, especially who developed, uh, who have depression in later age, especially if it's a new onset, late life, late life depression. Um, there's a lot of research that suggests that, um, depression can be one of the earlier symptoms of, um, preclinical dementia. Um, and, uh, and, and also because suicide rates are, are can be higher in older adults, um, but it also could be higher in veterans in males, um, white state of Americans. It really depends where you are and your particular population. So these are kind of, I'm saying them like they're blanket statements, but that's a little dangerous to, to think that these are the only people that are, are that are likely to commit suicide. Uh, let's see. So I'm sorry, I'm trying to be careful not to get to be too slow here. Um, so you'll have this in your slides, your handouts. It's basically showing some of the hallmark features of the three, but also so where some of those common features are. And I want to uh, thank a colleague of mine, Stephen Thielke, who used, the, who created this. So um, you think you know it all, right? But the problem is, is that there's a lot of overlap in these syndromes in older adults. You don't just get one D sometimes, you get two or three of the three Ds. Um, I've already hinted at it um, with say delirium incidents um, being higher in folks who are hospitalized who have dementia, but you can see here the rates of depression in dementia. Um, different studies have seen such a broad range of, of depression in dementia. Um, it's not uncommon, as I said before, to see delirium superimposed on dementia. Um, and then I've got even more. The, the reason I wanted to highlight the overlap syndrome is that these individuals typically have higher rates of functional decline and greater rates of placement in more supportive facilities. So I did kind of create a case here. Uh, I, I, of course, work at the VA. So I gave us a veteran. Uh, he's 66 years old and I've named him Joseph. Um, he's been divorced a couple of years from his second wife. It was not a particularly long marriage. He's brand new to your primary care clinic though, because he moved to be closer to his daughter living independently in an apartment. She came in with him though, because she's concerned. He sits around all day, forgets what she tells him. He has a pre-morbid history of diabetes and hypertension. They're historically under good control. So do you see any red flags here? Um, definitely, you know, we're already seeing that his daughter's worried, right? So here's some more information that is additional red flags. Uh, while there's reportedly historically good control, his current blood pressure and glucose are out of range. So instead of just doubling up on these medications or putting him on a more like a sliding scale insulin, actually think about whether he's taking those medications or insulin as prescribed. Maybe he's not taking them because he doesn't feel like life's worth living. Maybe he's not taking them as prescribed because he can't remember. Maybe he's lost his, um, some of his supplies. Um, and then a little extra querying, it actually turns out he misses the wife that he divorced um, and he's lonely. He doesn't have any friends. So you see the red flags, right? Also, as a sharp provider, you're noticing that he's not sharp and he seems disengaged. Let's think about what the next steps would be. I know you already know to initiate a workup. And so I'm going to talk about some um, available identification screening tools. Uh, I, I am promoting um, a, a pocket card that I have led, uh, been part of a team that's created from the National Aging and Cognition Education Work Group. Uh, we're all part of a GREC across the country, and the GREC stands for uh, Geriatric Research Education Clinical Center. We, our most uh, recent update was just from 2021, um, 
updating from previous versions from 2014 and 2011. So this pocket card has all the, the, the tips and tricks for what you should look for and tools for trying to assess. Um, and there's a little like, you know, Hey, uh, do be thoughtful. You want, this is just a suggested uh, approach. It is not um, the entire assessment. So there's my caveat as well. So for delirium, it highlights um, the symptoms. It reviews the CAM, the cognitive, uh, sorry, the confusion assessment method. And then on a new card that we have um, that I can show, it's a delirium reference guide that goes deeper into outpatient delirium uh, work, there's actually the BCAM. So it's a brief confusion assessment method. And I just love this uh, algorithm out of Vanderbilt that they created from the information in the BCAM to really help with um, the flow of trying to catch this. Uh, also, what's often useful is the modified Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale. It was additionally uh, set up for being used in intensive care units, but the MRAS is for non-ICU settings. And it kind of just helps you if you're like working um, and trying to like pass on to the next nurse or, or social worker, whoever's going to work with the patient next to kind of be like, okay, they're at a plus one right now. Um, and then they come back a week later, whoa, they're a plus two, what's going on? So it really just helps with tracking over time. And so here's a picture of our new 2022 delirium reference guide. Uh, the picture on the left is at the front of it. And then this middle part here, sorry, this right picture is because it also has a number of suggestions that you can share with the family members of ways to modify the environment, enhance daytime activities, and approach someone who may have had delirium in the past to help prevent delirium or someone who's resolving from delirium to continue to get better um, and to watch that they don't slip back. So always use uh, collateral sources of information if you can when working up delirium. It's a broad differential. Um, the delirium reference card uses the delirium acronym for what the differential could be. I learned I watch death when I was working with uh, med students back when I was in grad school. And that's the one I stuck with um, because for me, it really emphasizes just how dangerous delirium can be if um, it's not caught. So the good news, Joseph's workup was negative for delirium. Now, depression. I think I just always want to drive home the fact that you don't have to be a mental health professional to ask about symptoms of depression. Um, you have, there are recommended tools that can guide you. The real thing that you need, if you're not a mental health professional though, is a plan for how, what are you going to do if you get a positive on a screen? Like who, who's your warm handoff? Um, what resources do you have um, to, 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 to take them people to the next place if you do recognize something's going on? And always keep in mind, screening is covered um, by Medicare Part B. And so is uh, screening uh, for cognition and things like that as well. The PHQ-2 um, and PHQ-9 are related. Uh, the we have the PHQ-9 in the 3Ds card. It's well-validated, it's free, and it's pretty um, appropriate across all ages, actually. Um, there's also the geriatric depression scale. I use the 30 item version in my own clinic, but the 15 item version is good too. Um, and at the VA, we actually, um, are required to, and it's good that we do the Columbia suicide severity rating scale. Um, and we do that because just depression is being suicidal is a slightly different beast than, be just, than being depressed. Um, people can be suicidal for reasons that wouldn't necessarily flag on depression scales um, and vice versa. So you really wanna think about those uh, somewhat independently. Although being depressed puts you at increased risk for suicidality. I'm sort of, I'm making it sound like it's circular there, but it's a bit more challenging. Um, so here's the PHQ-2. I do recommend not just doing the PHQ-2. Um, this one really just kind of very simply asks little or no interest in doing things. That's sort of that anhedonia piece. And then just a real direct question, have you been feeling down or hopeless? The PHQ-9 has those, but it adds a few more things that are really um, important. And then of course, the last question, number nine on the PHQ-9, uh, do you think that you might be better off dead or would you want to hurt yourself in some way? These um, all could be considered either a, a high enough score is indicative of depression, but obviously there are some serious red flags here for suicidality as well. 
Uh, Joseph's workup was actually positive for depression, although he did not endorse um, the, the red flags for suicidality. I do include in your uh, notes here, um, the, the SSRS, the Columbia, uh, I include it um, just so that you have this as a resource, but obviously you'd want to read it over a bit more carefully. What it does is it goes beyond, even if you don't express current suicidal ideation, it wants to know additionally, have you ever felt this way before? Have you ever done anything to prepare? Have you ever uh, acted on that? Uh, and for Joseph, he actually has no suicidal ideation now, and he has not in the past. So moving on to dementia, you know, we've talked a lot about the red flags, right? And these are on that pocket card as well. I promise you, I won't read over all of these. Um, at the VA, we are not supposed to do uh, asymptomatic screening for cognitive impairment, whereas that's slightly at odds with sort of general guidance um, in geriatric clinics uh, and other settings. Um, however, I don't really have a huge conflict with that because at the end of the day, a red flag is a red flag. And if you look at some of these, um, there's a lot of good reasons that aren't glaring ones to go ahead and do a cognitive um, brief test to see what's going on, if that's where the, the, the problem is. And so on the 3Ds card, we have the mini cog, which is um, graciously and generously allowed for uh, clinical and teaching use by its author, Sue Borson, who is a University of Washington professor emeritus. Uh, it's super quick. It's a bit dirty. It's only five points. Uh, it does not diagnose dementia, but it is super useful when someone in that last minute of their appointment suddenly says, oh yeah, by the way, I got my electricity shut off because I was forgetting to make payments. Maybe I have a memory problem. You could do this really fast and then get a sense of what you need to do next. So you have them try to remember three words, then you have them draw a clock, and then you have them remember the words. Only the clock and the word recall are scored. Um, I would argue that even if someone remembers all three words, if their clock is really distorted, um, does not look like this is really, really bizarre, that's, that's a red flag as well. So I included this in your handouts. I won't read over what the elements are to have it be a quote unquote normal clock. But there are so many other brief cognitive measures out there at the VA currently. Um, we often use the slums, which is an unfortunate name for the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination. Um, what I really like if you have access to it is the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. There's also things like the Blessed um, uh, Orientation and Memory Concentration Test. I think I missed up my acronym there. There's also useful short tools um, that are um, developed the, at, by the Addenbrook or with the name Addenbrook, the MACE, which is the modified ACE or the ACE-3. That's actually an Australian uh, brief cognitive test, but there are US versions available. Okay. So I just, again, this is sort of more for reference. This is not in the pocket card, um, but you can go to mochatest.org and learn a lot more about the MOCA. It is more sensitive than the old school mini mental status examination, that MMSE. Uh, you do want to get certified to, to administer it, um, but that's a one-time thing and it doesn't take very long. And it, this is a, a useful test in that it's it comes in multiple English versions in more than 25 other languages. There is a telephone version, which also works for folks with visual impairment. There is a telemedicine version. Um, it just can be really, really useful. Uh, let's see. So then the, the slums, um, is one that's often used at the VA, as I mentioned. I think it's a good news, bad news thing. It's free. There's no training required. Um, but that also means that I think more often people are, are administering it wrong, that we want these to be administered in a standardized fashion so that the score is reproducible. If you, if I test the, the patient in the morning and you test them, let's pretend that you could test them later the same day and have them not remember it you would want our testing styles and the way we do it to give the same result. Um, there are a lot of biases though with the slums. It had a really small uh, research sample. There's been less follow-up research probably because we VA employees don't get much time for that. Um, and there's uh, some cultural and SES factors as well. That research sample that they they developed it on was um, a very like mean age 77 set of older white male veterans in the St. Louis area. 
Uh, I would say though, that it is a uh, pretty adaptable for telephone. You, you just basically prorate it and it's a 26 point possible. And then also for telemedicine, it's very easily adaptable, although there is no official version. So why would you want to use a brief cognitive test? I think the number one reason is to get a quick sense of global cognitive function. Uh, glaring deficits will show up. Um, you can also use it to follow people over time. Uh, say with the MOCA, you could even do it uh, multiple times over the course of a one-week inpatient stay. You can uh, do it um, over the years to see, you know, is this sort of uh, is there stability to their thinking abilities or not? And then in a medical setting, I mean, it's pretty useful to know whether there's any reason to question whether they have decision-making capacity. Uh, I would say that's a little bit of a CYA situation, but that's, that's with the best interest of the patient at heart, of course. Um, and then in my area, it's really usually about trying to catch some cognitive decline early because then folks may or may not come on to see me, a neuropsychologist, or maybe they'll get further workup with other specialists. Um, and we may be able to diagnose someone with mild cognitive impairment or the earliest stages of Alzheimer's. And this can have many benefits, whether it's the early introduction of a cholinesterase inhibitor for Alzheimer's, um, perhaps most importantly, catching any reversible influences like sleep apnea and that chance to do some care planning. And then uh, oftentimes it's assisting and motivating patients towards positive behavioral change. And in that, um, I'm thinking of situations where maybe I have someone who started drinking too much during the pandemic and they need um, that mild cognitive impairment diagnosis while it may be an earlier sign of dementia, it might also just be that they've let their drinking get out of hand and they need to, they, they need a motivation to work on that. So I do always warn though, not to overinterpret what you get from these brief cognitive tests. Um, they are less able to detect things for people that are sort of at those tail ends of the distribution. Um, the, the folks that are the highest functioning and folks whose baseline is a bit lower. Uh, I mentioned learning disability, lower education can impact these. I mentioned hearing vision problems. Um, maybe there's some items they can't complete because they have limited hand function. So at the end of the day, they're so great, but they really are poor as standalone measures. You want to think about other risk factors, the context, um, and also get that input. So for our, our vet, uh, Joseph, he had a 25 on the mocha. And for me, that's really kind of a gray zone, right? I don't, I can't just say, oh, you're great, Joseph, go away, never come back. You, there's nothing going on, but it's also not so low that it's particularly alarming. So, so in, for him, given that there's these other things with his glucose out of range, um, not taking his blood pressure medication and feeling super lonely, and we've identified depression. I would not just sort of knee jerk, send him to a neuropsychologist for a dementia workup, um, especially because we haven't assessed function, which is a critical component for a dementia diagnosis in that three D's card. There's a functional activities questionnaire. Um, these are just to help you think of some of the areas to query. It also gives you sort of a, a rating scale on which to do it. And then that can carry on, especially if you have your electronic health record for maybe they look, maybe say Joseph um, has no dependencies right now, but he's maybe in sort of the MCI range on the MOCA will treat his depression and then maybe see him back in six months to a year. And of course, reassessing the functional activities questionnaire would be useful too at that time um, because we could catch if there's a decline there. So let's see all of this. If you haven't figured it out yet is that I always worry. I don't want people to miss dementia, but I also won't want people getting diagnosed with dementia who haven't had all possible other causes eliminated and excluded. Uh, that's something of course, that we all want to watch out for. Uh, the three D's card that I keep talking about has a last panel that sort of runs over some additional factors that can impact thinking and daily function. And I use that sort of as a segue toward what I really would love for our healthcare system to get to the point of where we actually really focus on healthy brain aging, thinking more about risk factors that could be managed or avoided that could, um, promote resilience reserve. Um, and thus sort of stave off um, any of these changes in mentation, actually really all three of them.
So I have a three D's action plan. I created this. Um, <laughs> it's really silly, but it's basically just, it gives me sort of this stepwise approach, right? What's step one? It's to identify and then rule out, right? Um, and then that could lead to just following people over time, monitoring them. It may kick you up to a more in-depth evaluation, depending on what you find. Always keeping in mind, though, that if you're in the monitoring phase, you might need to kick up to um, an in-depth evaluation at, at, at some at some point. And I think some of the reason I love working with older adults is that there's rarely just some perfectly clear-cut, obvious thing going on. Um, these are often really complex people. They've lived lives that are that have had a lot going on and thus to me are, are very interesting. Um, so let's think back about Joseph. Here's sort of that reminder of his background. We were able to solidly rule out delirium. Depression was indeed identified and treatment was initiated, but I would argue that dementia is to be determined. We're certainly not throwing that one around with him yet, um, but I would have it in the back of my mind over the next year or so to, to, to keep an eye. Uh, so I have this uh, Gary Larson cartoon. Gary, if you're tuning in, I am only using your cartoon for educational purposes. Um, Superman's in his later years. He's standing at this really what looks like a window of a very tall building um, with his cape on, looking back at Lois saying, now, wait, where was I going? Um, and so the point for this is, does that tell us he has dementia? We are not sure. Does it tell us he has delirium? Not sure. Depression? Not sure. Regardless though, um, this is important uh, and, and should not be ignored. Thank you. I really uh, pushed through that pretty quickly. I have here on this last slide, um, my email at the VA. Um, I can also provide my University of Washington email. Uh, and then also uh, Julie Moore is a nurse that I work with, our Greek education nurse, and she is the person to whom you could send requests if you have them for yourself or for your clinic for any of those 3Ds pocket cards or the delirium uh, reference uh, guide card, um, which is our newer product. Um, she just needs to know uh, who you are, what, you know, where, where they should send them and how many you want, really. Okay, thank you. I might stop sharing my screen, although I guess I can show it again if uh, anybody has questions. Um, so we did have a question from the beginning, um, Emily. Uh, Justin was wondering what are the typical roles in the PACs? Is it like social worker, nutritionist, nurse, pharmacist, physician? Yes, exactly. I guess I, I, I didn't think to define that. Yeah, it's really when you think of sort of the full complement that you could have in a primary care team. Um, there's sort of the true like basics, which you just mentioned. Um, but additionally, in some of the VA PAC teams, they might have a dietitian. There might be a physical therapist. There could be an occupational therapist. Um, and of course, all of this is depending on having and, and a, and a, a uh, admin person, right? That's a critical role in a PAC team as well. Um, and of course, this is all dependent upon being able to have your team fully staffed and funded, um, which is, of course, a big challenge at times. So the roles of the individuals in that team do vary depending on how full the team is, if there are any missing elements, um, and of course, sort of how folks have agreed to take on certain responsibilities. I know some PAC teams were only the, the primary care docs do the brief cognitive tests. Others where social workers, psychologists, and the nurses do it um, and to sort of share that burden. Other questions, folks? I think I sort of posed them during your talk. So um, the other questions that I have in the chat are more logistical kinds of things. Um, everyone was very interested in the cards. <laughs> so I already sent that off. Oh, good. And I do see someone asked about trying to get, this really resonates for me. I can't tell you how, well, I will tell you how much, but um, you have been, um, is it Andreas Fisher said that they, they've they been trying to get their parents to switch to a geriatrician and they refuse to give up their family practice. My father had a stroke this past summer and he's uh, now, is he 81 now? Um, and he has been so healthy. He had a, a general internist and he had pretty much never been there because he's a retired physician. He kind of would just call the guy up and tell him what he needed. And they had no relationship and this provider had no idea what my father's baseline was. And so he goes in 
looking like an 81 year old after his stroke. Um, and the primary care really pretty much didn't take anything very seriously for trying to find why in the world, this super healthy person who had no heart problems had a stroke. Um, and I was incredibly frustrated and I could not get my father to switch. Um, now I am going to try again. I realized that trying to do that in what felt like a more acute phase was had a lot less chance of success. Um, I mostly try to sell it when I'm working with my patients. Um, well, first of all, don't sell it. If there isn't access, that's another challenge. There are not enough geriatricians out there. So, so availability for a geriatrician might not be possible. Um, but if it is, I typically try to explain like, why would you not want more time with your doctor? Um, geriatricians typically have longer appointment times and it's the same copay. So if you're, if your parents are like mine, they're very, very worried about spending more money or having insurance, not cover things when they don't need to. Um, and, and so I, I try to figure out, maybe this is a tricky way of using what matters. I try to think about what matters and how then is what I'm thinking will help them also going to help them get what matters. So I don't know if that'll help, but I too know that. Um, I've unmuted. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name Velier. Um, and so they had a question. Yeah, Karina. So uh, I made a note that uh, to my experience um, that narcotics are overused in the hospitals. And I was taking care of for my mom. And uh, as soon as she, the nurses would notice any type of pain, they were just ready to give her oxy or something else. Mm. So, and uh, of course the delirium problem could be uh, one of the reasons for delirium problem, the overuse of uh, narcotics. If you have any like authority or something, I would like you to kind of um, uh, communicate because it's not like one time or two times I was experiencing that or encountered that. So I was actually trying to get to my mom's place six o'clock in the morning so they would not give her narcotics if Tylenol would help, for example, or ibuprofen would help. Yeah, so they just come. I, I hear you. It's such a challenge, and I guess. I think because all of my work is outpatient, I more often see the situation where something was prescribed and given for acute pain in a hospital setting, and then somehow got continued mm -hmm. um, and, and is absolutely no longer uh, ha being the effective treatment for the pain it was and, and maybe even perpetuating. So those decisions inpatient, I just, it must be so tough, but yes, there's an overall movement um, towards de-prescribing, not over-prescribing um, and, but you have to balance it. You know, we also, if there's an acute pain issue um, we also have to be humane, um, but I, I yeah, mm -hmm. right. I'm sure you felt that push pull yes. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think they don't uh, think twice or uh, analyze the pain level or something. It just, you know, it's ready. You can see how it could become a knee jerk kind of like, oh, this will allow me to go on to the next person. Yeah. But this is. <laughs> This is probably a lot of times due to understaffing and undertraining. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. If I may just uh, take another minute of yours. I have another uh, uh, relative of mine who was actually relatively young and he was uh, transferred to nursing home. When I came to visit him, he didn't recognize where he's at and he's relatively young again in his 50s. He wasn't, uh, he was, he had uh, hallucinations. And it's all because of the oxycodone they were giving him without even asking him. Oh you know, my, yeah. Well, something. I will certainly say that, um, you know, I, I talked about delirium, like it's only a geriatric syndrome, but it is not. It's just that it's so mm -hmm. much more prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, and, yes. and But uh, anyone can have a delirium and it's super common. It wouldn't meet the criteria to sort of be a true delirium, but confusion, 
with, with some short, you know, short-term confusion with some medications or, you know, disorientation, you know, sometimes when people go to the emergency room, they're in acute distress and then they get moved to one unit, then they get moved to another. A lot of times there aren't the normal like window daylight cues going on. Um, you can see how someone who was younger, healthier could easily get get off. Um, I ended up personally with a, a multi-day hospital stay with an induction that went bad and ended up with an emergency C-section. And I got to tell you, I had no idea what the day was that my kid was finally born because I, I had just sort of been in some, this, this awkward limbo state for days. Um, but again, that it comes back. Right. And I was on narcotics and I was a little fuzzy after that, but again, you get off them, you get, things start gelling again, yeah. assuming yeah. that there's intact in the intact case I was circuits. mentioning about, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, that could have uh, be causing the injury too, because he was, he had a hip replacement and he had hallucinations or delirium, whatever. And uh, he thought that there's a, a wind, uh, there's a uh, ice on his uh, window, but it was summertime, you know? And he yeah. thought his daughter is running away. He uh, jumped to get her, you know? So he oh, had that's a, a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. So he yeah. was a, it's a, like a, a big risk for um, injury as well. Absolutely. Well, that's a little scary. I see a question in the chat about how much am I seeing lack of clearance, uh, liver, kidney contributing to the 3Ds. Um, I, with my, if you mean my personal experience, um, I would say I actually luckily typically don't see those folks. Um, so my perception of how common that is, is affected by the fact that I'm really lucky that we have a system set up where I don't see people unless we've made sure they've double checked these certain areas and, and those labs, um, and, uh, if they're of chronic kidney disease, um, if they're, uh, LFTs are off. We have certain things set up to try to identify those types of conditions before I would see them. Um, so those medical aspects are usually caught. Now, I definitely, I, I, I work with some people who are on dialysis, um, who are concerned that they have dementia, but what I'm typically assessing for is something that's changed beyond kind of the general sort of fuzziness that a lot of folks report, um, that are older and have been on dialysis. Again, there's also those fluctuations, um, for that, that schedule that they're on. Um, so I'm usually kind of going, looking for signs and symptoms beyond that of potential, de uh, dementia. So um, it looks like there's some issues with the um, evaluation survey. My apologies, everyone. I will check with the powers that be to find out what's going on and see if that um, I can get it to work. Um, and hopefully next time or by email correction, um, you'll be able to access that without getting the, the survey has already been taken issue. My apologies. Dr. Anybody, go ahead. I was gonna say, is there anybody else with any other questions? I, um, having done this talk a number of times, I always change around my slides a little bit. And I hit a point, uh, at about the hour mark where I was like, oh no, I must have so much more left. And so I sped up a little bit to make sure there were time for, there was time for questions. And of course, then I ended up with slightly more time than I expected. So is there anything that anyone feels like I kind of rushed over? Um, well, I mean, I'm going to repeat everything. what I'm seeing on the chat box, which is it's just excellent as always, Dr. Trichu. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I am always happy to take back channel emails, questions as well. Not every, you know, everyone has a different style for how they want to, um, to ask questions. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, well, I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited for the rest of the talks in this series. Um, so uh, uh, I feel really lucky to have gotten to go early on, although it's always tough to follow Stephen Thielke. Um, but uh, it's I, I'm glad to get out of the way early so you can be even more impressed by the rest of the speakers. Um, Marianne Grafton is asking if you might say a little bit more about brain wellness and prevention. Oh, and I'm not even, I don't, I don't even know this person and I, I'm not even paying them, but I love this opportunity. Yes. <laughs> um, because this is where we want to go, right? We want to be, um, 
working with our patients and, and creating a, actually a full system that is healthcare, not managing illness, right? We call it healthcare for a reason. So our same work group, our national work group actually has this, oh dear, the the blurring I set up is going to mess with my little healthy, uh, my brain health and quality of life and aging booklet that we created that hits on a bunch of like important topics, fighting loneliness, um, engaging in physical activity, um, uh, thinking about your vision and hearing and how to maximize those right to help support uh, a brain health. It talks about side effects and, and polypharmacy, um, a mood also as well. So we incorporate that sleep, mental health. Um, so I do have a lot of other resources that we share. Um, I also have a, a six session healthy brain aging group. That's like a psychoeducational group for people who are motivated and really want to try to work on using um, sorry, developing smart goals and, and using their own sorts of skills and resources to try to figure out how to incrementally improve in sort of a holistic manner, um, their brain health. Um, can I type the title of the booklet? Yes. Um, actually Julie Moore, who is the name as the contact for the other things is the same person. Let's see if I can hold this brain health and quality of life in aging. But if you just say healthy brain aging or brain health booklet it, to Julie Moore, she'll know exactly what we're talking about. And we did do a talk a couple of years ago. It'll be in the archives for this series that was about sort of um, more healthy brain aging, dementia prevention. Um, and I gave that, I don't know if Dr. Cochran can remember when it was, but it's in the archives. Um, probably it was two years ago, three years ago. We try to redo it every so often. Um, yeah, I think it was a couple of years ago, but you can actually, you should be able to just search um, under your name or um, the, ti uh, you know, one of the words of the title. Yeah, and I used, there's the Lancet Commission article that was talking about what risk factors exist at different stages of life for developing dementia. And I really focused on that talk on the midlife and late life um, contributors that are non-genetic, right? So you, you could argue they're modifiable. Some of the early life ones are like, how much education did you get? So some things aren't always so modifiable. Um, uh, you know, getting people to quit smoking if they haven't quit smoking is probably one of the best things ever. Um, oh, I just put the, how do I do this? I, when I typed in Julie Moore at va.gov, it looks like it went only to hosts and panelists. Oh. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send it. I, I I put that in the chat box earlier, but I'll send it again. Okay, thanks. I think I have limited. No, you can just select more people. <laughs> they, just for the audience, they do not want to give me full control, right? Like that would be dangerous. <laughs> I would probably really screw up the system. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I, and you know, I do, I incorporate brain health um, information no matter, pretty much no matter what I'm diagnosing, I don't care if I'm diagnosing someone with dementia, we're still going to talk about proactive things they can do to improve quality of life and, and um, support brain health. Uh, and again, it's doing this, this, what matters kind of way, right? Like I'm certainly uh, in a patient who hates crossword puzzles. I'm not going to tell them they should go do a bunch of crossword puzzles. Um, and, and if their goal is not to work on that, but their goal is that they want to be able to continue to walk their dog. Um, I'm going to problem solve with them over, okay, what can we do to create support systems? So it's safe for you to go out and walk your dog, even though you were getting lost, maybe there's a way to do it. Um, that, that is, can be done in, in a safe manner. Oh, sleep too. Absolutely. Levon. Um, sleep is like my number one. In fact, in the booklet, it is. It's number one. It's the first page in the booklet is sleep. Um, I, I can't stress how much, uh, I've been able to see at least a sense of improvement, even if it doesn't come out on objective testing, having someone help get their sleep cycle regulated, getting slightly better, um, quality and, and quantity of sleep can make a real big difference, mostly because it makes your mood better too. Right. That can kind of have such a downstream effect or a ripple effect is what I'm trying to say. All right. Thank you so much. This 
is always such an excellent presentation. Um, I learn every single time new um, ideas. I really appreciate all of the focus on assessment and that sort of thing as well. Um, everyone, I'll get the evaluation survey fixed and um, you should be able to fill it out next week uh, without problem. And um, thank you so much for attending. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks.